as we get older as athletes, we tend to uh, lose muscle mass and gain body fat. Um, and that's something that's really discouraging for most athletes. You, you can become very aware of it. And, and the solution for that problem is actually quite simple. Just keep on lifting weights like you did probably when you were younger. This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. Joe Friel, welcome back to the podcast. We are so grateful to have you back on. Uh, you've been on our podcast before. It was a great episode. Everyone loves having one of the founding fathers of triathlon and triathlon coaching on the show. We are, again, so grateful to have you. Can you tell the listeners uh, what have you been up to since since we last spoke? Hi, Jordy. Yeah, and, and Jared, I, I, um, I've, I've been working on a project for coaches. I've been This has been the back of my mind for years. All the books and all all the projects I've done have always for athletes, but I've always wanted to do something for coaches because I, when I started in coaching, which is eighty, um, there really was nothing out there. There was no information, even the smallest information. There was nothing, and I still coaches who are a little bit started in coaching, and so I'm, I'm working on this project to to. So, to answer that question and to solve this problem, which I've seen for years, which is how do we how do we grow the profession of coaching, not in terms of numbers of coaches, but in terms of how professional coaches are. And so that's what I'm digging into now kind of deeply. It's really exciting. And what about from an athlete perspective? What have you been focusing on athlete-wise? What have you been diving into and, and really trying to push? What kind of messages or, or lessons have you been pushing on athletes recently? Pretty much the same I've been talking to athletes about for years, which is, you know, there's there are very you have to do to, to be a good athlete. And they're, they're mostly, quite honestly, lifestyle issues. You know, we'll probably get into these sort of things later on, but it has to do with how you design your life to fit what you're trying to accomplish in sport. That's a big challenge for for most athletes to blend the two together. And so, you know, so social media and so, you know, I, I do a lot of talking about that on the social media side, which is along the lines of getting to sleep and, you know, get carried away. And, you know, it's motivation is a good thing, but motivation can take you too far. It can take you to overtraining. And so that's the stuff I've been talking about, gosh, for I don't know how many years, but a long time with, about it with athletes. And, and quite honestly, it'll probably continue because uh, not that athletes are slow learners, but they're resistant learners. Now, they want to try to control their motivation they don't want to try to get more sleep so they can get more push. You know, they try to get less sleep. They can get more into their day or, they, you know, we're all, this, we're all familiar with these things, seeing athletes all the time. And that's the stuff I keep on our athletes. And it's nothing new at all. It's just the same thing I'm talking to athletes about for 40 years. The same consistency message, and we will get into that. Um, but we want to start with the topic of, aging something that you are really you've dived into in a lot of your work um and with your book you know faster after 50 i really love the message that you push out in there and it's it's coming from a place of we don't have to have such limiting beliefs about what's possible as we're aging i just find that message really inspiring and uh, one of the things that you really push uh, early in the book is talking about the science on aging uh, looks at things from a, a global population perspective. Um, but what you talk about is that if you're listening to this podcast, if you're a triathlete, if you're interested in this kind of content, you're probably not in the general population. You're probably in the top end of the population that are fit and healthy and active. And so that the science on that kind of stuff doesn't always apply to you. So let's, let's start with aging and talk about uh, what are the key messages you're trying to get across to people um, with regards to limiting the loss of performance as you age? Probably a good conversation about about aging has to do with what I wrote about in my the first couple of chapters of my fifty book written for aging athletes. It, it has to do with the fact that 
And when we get old, what we tend to do is we tend to gravitate to a long, slow distance where just everything becomes slow. Um, we don't really do anything anymore that has any speed to it. Uh, no intent, you know, it's all low intensity all the time. And, and I'm not saying there's nothing, anything wrong with low intensity. It's good. But you don't want just a diet only of low intensity if you want to be an athlete and be competitive in your age category as you get older. So what I did in that book was I went back and, and looked at some studies that athletes over the course of uh, something like, I forgot the exact details, but, now, but like 20 years, so they looked in one of the studies, for example, of athletes who were uh, uh, U.S. national class members, and put them into the into the lab and found out what the was when they so they're in their twenties. Twenty years later, they come back again in, in the um, in the first couple of chapters of that Fast After Fifty book that I wrote a few years ago. Um, I I. A, site, a couple of studies that are very interesting studies. Most of these are not done the way these were studies were done. Most studies, they don't look at the same group of uh, subjects over the course of uh, years or even decades. What they do is they want, if they want to compare 50-year-olds with 20-year-olds, they, they grab a bunch of 20-year-olds and a group of 50-year-olds, they test them all, and they draw conclusions from that about what the difference is between these two groups. That doesn't really tell you anything because there's big problem is there's they're not following what those twenty year olds did for the next thirty years of their lives, and that's what these studies that I I cite in the book did. They actually took the athletes into a, into the laboratory. They were world, they were national class U.S. hunters, and they had them um, um, do a VO two max test to find out where they were right then in their twenties. Then 20 years later, they brought them back again and tested all over again. Same same thing, VO2 max. Um, and they also asked questions like, are you still racing is one of the questions. Uh, are you still training? How much intensity work do you do? How many miles do you put in? So they com- And they compared that with what they were doing when they were in their 20s. What they found was, Athletes who were still racing, still doing high-intensity training, had had very little difference, very little change in their VO2 max over the course of 20 years. It had gone down a little bit, but it wasn't significant. Um, The athletes uh, who had uh, stopped training altogether, did no more races, didn't go for any runs or anything at all, uh, those athletes were experiencing a gigantic loss of the VO2 max. It was something in the order of about of about uh, 12% over the course of 20 years that the VO2 max had dropped. Then there's a group in the middle who were just in long, slow distance now. They were no longer doing intervals, no longer racing, uh, but they kept active by going out and doing things. And they were losing, if I recall right, at the rate of something like about 6% over the course of 20 years. So we have the group who was training and doing high intensity pretty much maintain their their uh, VO2 max over the course of 20 years, and the other two groups uh, lost a lot of fitness, a lot of VO2 max, with the group doing absolutely nothing and lost everything. But even the group who was still exercising, albeit at a very low intensity and very very slow runs, they were losing a significant amount of fitness also over that 20 years compared to the the other group. So that was there's a couple of studies like that that I cited to make the point that if you really want to maintain your your racing fitness, as you get older, you need to include some high-intensity training. That does not mean going out and doing high-intensity every day. Um, what I recommend is an athlete do something like five easy workouts a day and two hard workouts a day, or not per day. I mean, two hard workouts per week, five hard workouts, five easy workouts per week, two hard workouts per, per week. Um, so out of a total of seven, only two are going to be hard, and those should be spaced out like Tuesday, Friday, or something like that so that they're spaced and you get some rest between them. But um, I found that as athletes get older, doing something like that does, does a lot to maintain their fitness and still allows them uh, to recover um, uh, between workouts. The other workouts should all be easy workouts to build aerobic fitness, which is what athletes typically are pretty good at doing anyway, 
when they get to in their 50s and 60s and so forth. So that's that's what I think is probably the most important thing from the book is you've got to maintain some intensity in your training. I was going to talk about another topic that's related, which is that um, as you get older, as we get older as athletes, we tend to uh, lose muscle mass and gain body fat. Um, and that's something that's really discreet for most athletes. You, you can become very aware of it. And, and the solution for that problem is actually quite simple. Just keep on lifting weights like you did probably when you were younger and try not to miss any ep- uh, sessions. So do like two, maybe three weight sessions per week, every week, week after week after week after week. And that will maintain your strength. I see this all the time in aging athletes. Um, they've gained a lot of belly fat and they've just lost an awful lot of muscle. Um, the exercise they do in the in the gym helps to maintain the muscle. The workouts they do in their primary sport helps to keep the uh, body fat at bay, along with things along the lines of nutrition, which I'll come back to later. But that that's the other key takeaway in my book is that you need to do something to maintain mass and uh, try to control or or even reduce how much body fat we're, we're adding as we get older. Um, the body fat thing is a tough issue for issue, for athletes. It's one of those things that seems to sneak up on us uh, without even paying attention. One of the things I learned in writing that book, the Fast After 50 book, was that scientists are now saying that as you get older, you need to eat more protein in your in your diet, and and that's good, by the way, for for building strength. Um, but that also means that something has to come out of your diet. We just don't want to add more calories to your diet by eating more protein. So what I would suggest you do is you cut back on carbohydrate, especially the carbohydrates that that um, are easily turned into body fat, uh, starches and sugars and things that are metabolized very quickly. Uh, when you're between meals, you know, avoid eating snacks along that line. If you're going to snack, eat something like fruit, uh, vegetables, things that are good for you instead of eating something out of a package, plastic package. Almost everything in a plastic package is bad for you. So so that's the, the third thing is, is trying to control our, our fat by body fat by limiting our diet to foods that um, are not going to be quite as conducive to make us uh, gain uh, body fat. Okay, that's an uh, unbelievably good summary um, and almost covered a lot of the, the, uh, the discussion topics that we were uh, aiming to go down that rabbit rabbit warren with. Um, the good news is that, um, that 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 you can definitely, from what you've done in your study, see that you know obviously uh, high intensity is going to contribute to maintaining or or even continuing to improve your performance, even even as a fifty year old or sixty year old. Um, I'm sure you've got many examples, Joe, of people who who have been sedentary for a long time and then taken up um, a sport, whether it be marathon running or or triathlon and have had a VO2 of 40, yet, you know, started training for five, six years and ended up with an improved VO2, even at 55 or 60 years of age. Has that been your experience? Yes, that is certainly possible. Um, if you take somebody who has been inactive and, and get them started in in some kind of an, uh, an endurance activity, um, running, cycling, swimming, triathlon, whatever, some some sort of sport that they enjoy doing, which is the most the most important thing. Sometimes people ask me what what sport should I do um, to get in better shape, and the answer always is the same thing: the one you enjoy doing. That's the one you should do um, the most, and that that will do the most for helping you to maintain your um, um, your your youth, if you will. Um, I run into far too many people. I'm I'm in my late seventies now. I'm almost eight years old. And I run into far too many people, let's say athletes now, far too many people who are my age who are basically withering away. They're, and they're, you can see it. I've, I've known some people for, you know, a few decades, and you watch them over the course of several decades lose their muscle, um, uh, lose their posture, lose their fitness, basically. And it's just because, you know, they, they didn't their lifestyle seriously enough. And that's really the key to this whole thing is you've got to maintain this this athlete's lifestyle your entire life. It's not something you do up until you're 50 and then you throw it away and somehow 
start doing things that are not good for your health and so forth, you need to be, maintain that athlete's lifestyle well into your, you know, your 80s, your 90s. I know athletes in their 80s and 90s. I, I, I wrote about an athlete here not too long ago. This has been, I guess, a year or so ago now. A Frenchman who was who was uh, breaking records on the track in uh, cycling uh, at age 104, um, and the guy was remarkable things. You know, riding an hour and 17 at, at 17 miles per hour, which is quite quite fast for somebody who's 104 years old. Um, and he's continued to train every day on his bike. Uh, you know, the people like that just blow me away. They're they're really great. Um, indicators of what we can do with our own lives if we do the same sort of same things they're doing, which is just stay active. Stay active and be very consistent. Unfortunately, that gentleman died here a couple of years ago at age 109, but he was still riding his bike every day. Um, uh, he, he just was an amazing individual. There are lots of people like that out there in the world who do, who just are are very good about maintaining their health and their fitness regardless of age. And yet I, I'm in the gym sometimes and I'll overhear a conversation going on in the locker room and I'll hear some guy say he's 35 now and he thinks he's over the hill and he's no longer going to be able to do anything. And I'm just blown away, you know, 35 years old. He's still a kid. He's still got a tremendous number of things he can do in his, his life physically. And he's already thrown it away because he thinks he's too old. It just blows me away to hear people talk about how they see themselves as being old and not even close to being old. They're they're still quite young. And they can still accomplish a lot of things in sport and in life. I absolutely love that point, Joe. It's um it's the exact message I was talking about with 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 what I really resonate with at the start of your book, which is just breaking down the belief of what's actually possible. And um, when you hear that story of a guy riding his bike to 109, you go, "Wow, that is uh, that shows how many years you could have in you uh, where you're staying this active." You really, you really gave a great point talking about main, the importance of maintaining muscle mass, and I want to get a little bit more specific on that. What is your, what is your um, gym routine? What is your weightlifting routine for yourself? Um, what, do you, what are you doing sure. throughout the week specifically? Uh, how, how often? Yeah, I, I lift twice a week, religiously on Monday and Thursdays, um, and I, you know, I do a, a full body workout. It takes probably about forty minutes to get it all done. And this this whole thing has to do with where I live, actually. Uh, I used to go to a gym. I found that to be kind of a nuisance because you had to wait to get into a machine. Somebody else is using it. You had to drive or ride your bike or run to the gym, which took extra time, et cetera. So there was just a lot of minor things I didn't like about going to the gym. And sometimes I would use those as, as excuses. So here, I don't know, gosh, probably, oh, it's been 20 years ago now. I decided to build a gym on my own in my garage. So I took one bay of my garage and um, turned it into a, a gym. Uh, so I've got everything out there I need for all the uh, exercises and workouts I do. And I keep adding things to it every year or so. I'll add something new to my gym. That led my wife and I to decide we need a different house because we, our house, when I started doing that, only had a two bay garage. So I had to park my car outside on the on the on the driveway. Um, I'm sure my neighbors are getting tired of seeing my my car in the driveway year after year after year. So we finally decided we would simply buy a house that's got a three bay garage. We, we've done that twice now. We're in the second, and I've got this great gym now that I that I uh, I use twice a week, um, and I do a full body exercise, full body workout. And it's not just strength. The strength is the main focus of it. I've got a rack of weights I use um, for total body workout for strength, um, and squats and bench presses and curls and uh, calf raises, et cetera, et cetera. But I also do a lot of you know core things, um, uh, planks, uh, uh, side planks, and 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 uh, um, front planks to to maintain the, the core area. I uh, do a lot of stretching exercises. Uh, and one thing I've noticed in older people is they tend to lose their range of motion. So I do a lot of range of motion exercises just to my, kind of maintain my my uh, ability to uh, uh, do things that just around the house that a lot of older people can't do, like, you know, reach over and touch something on the floor, pick up a piece of paper off the floor, little things like that that somehow leave you when you get older. 
I work on my balance. So this is something I've seen also in older people. As they age, they lose their balance. And so I work on that. So I have this whole program that I go through to uh, maintain um, lots of things that have to do with, with strength, uh, with mobility, which you mentioned, with range of motion. Um, and, and all this stuff has to do with my basically my uh, physiological health. And, and I've managed to maintain my, my body mass over the years. Um, and um, it's just because I've been consistent. It's not because the stuff I do is because I do it consistently. I do it two times a week, every week. That's been going on for month after month, after year, after year, after year, after year. So it's the sort of thing you got to do. It's not complicated, but it, it, uh, it's, it's just that consistency principle again. One last question uh, on the specificity of that. What kind of rep and uh, set range are you doing? Are you doing something like three sets of eight reps or a bit uh, heavier and lower? So three sets of five reps or four sets of 12 reps? The white stuff. Yeah, I'm doing three sets of it. It kind of depends on where I am in the in the year. I kind of I kind of periodize things uh, today, uh, like I did when I was when I was younger. Same sort of thing. So I'm yeah, I'm, I'll sort off this uh, what I consider consider my season, which is going to be starting in the late fall, early winter, and then I'll start doing just lighter weights with uh, uh, higher repetitions, ten to fifteen repetitions. Challenging myself to uh, whenever I feel I can do 16 or 17 repetitions, increase the, the load a little bit. And after a few weeks of doing that, I begin to increase the loads and do fewer reps. And by the time I get to the uh, the peak of that season uh, or that seasonal program, I am doing uh, about oh, three to six reps uh, for each of the exercises, each of the strength exercises, um, three sets of those. Uh, with with pretty heavy loads, and um, I've been doing that same sort of thing for for decades now, and it it just pays off long term. I know it's it's been very beneficial to my health and longevity. You're a great example, Joe, to everybody listening of uh, you know practicing what you preach, and you know all the stuff you put into your book. You're actually a, a, an unbelievably great example of of someone doing what the things that you've you know mentioned in every chapter in your book and and with your actual cardiovascular side uh, apart from the strength side you're still doing two high intensity sessions yourself each week or how how has that developed how did you get to 79 80 years of age i need i need to qualify that i just came off a period in my life which is that kind of messed me up um my wife and i decided many years ago we have we invited my granddaughter we to uh, to go to Europe with her she when she graduated from high school this is probably when she was like ten years so she pick any she wanted to go in the world especially Europe and we would take her there after her graduation well because of COVID that got pushed back by two years so we went this past spring and we spent um, four weeks in Europe um, and I well really wasn't able to do anything along the lines of lifting weights or exercise other than simply like walking and doing simple little things around the, around the room. So I had this big drop in my consistency, which lasted for about six weeks. And lo and behold, when I got back from that, I developed a, a kidney stone. And that set me back for another, gosh, two or three weeks, I guess it was. And um, so I've, I've been um, – so I'm just barely getting back into my normal routine and, uh, and the routine is coming along quite nicely, but I'm, I'm, I'm not where I normally would be in terms of types of exercises I'm doing. But that's, you know, that's the sort of thing you run into as you get older. Is you get all these little obstacles that get in your way. You get all these little things that happen to you from time to time. Even if you've been very good about maintaining your health, there are still things that are going to sneak up on you. Um, and you've just got to be prepared when those things come around, like the kidney stone. Uh, you know, really very little control over things like that. And it's going to have a big impact on your, on your training. So I'm right now trying to get back into my routine. I'm riding the bike seven times a week, uh, five easy, two hard, two hard workouts are, have been, they're not right now because I'm still kind of getting my base back from having been through all this stuff with my health and the travel. Uh, but the two hard workouts typically have been number one, a group ride on the weekend, like Sunday, I do a group ride, um, 
Uh, that's now changed to a Tuesday morning group ride. I've, I've noticed since I've been off the bike for a while because of all the stuff I had, I had in my life. So I'll be doing a hard workout on Tuesday. And then I'm doing one workout a week where I do hill repeats on the bike, um, high intensity hill repeats. And it kind of depends on where I'm in the season, what kind of hill repeats they are. If, if I'm in a, early in the season, I'm going to be doing uh, longer uh, hill repeats that I um, intensity just, just below my threshold, my lactate threshold. Um, and when I'm at a point where I'm trying to do higher intensity stuff, I'll shorten them to about three minute hill repeats with uh, a much higher intensity, something more like about about twenty uh, percent of you of I'm sorry of uh, of lactate threshold or FTP, twenty percent of lactate of FTP uh, higher than uh, what I was doing before. So that's kind of the routine I am follow, and I change that around with the seasons, as you can tell from what I just said there. But I'm not there yet. I'm kind of still working my way back to it. And I hope, in fact, I kind of hope I'll get I, – I started back in the charting ride last week, uh, the group ride, and uh, I'm kind of thinking about doing going back to my high intensity on Friday of this week and keeping my fingers crossed that the weather holds out. We've had a lot of rain recently. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but uh, if everything goes right, I'll have me back to two hard workouts per week again. That, that's that's brilliant, and um, I'm really so pleased you've been able to give us a little glimpse into your own personal journey, and and that kind of brings us to the next topic that we wanted to talk about, which is how do you how do you balance as an athlete, and you know. There's, there's probably there's people who do some activity and there's people who do none. So anybody who does some sort of activity, I'm going to call an athlete at this particular stage. But but most of our listeners are, are race orientated. Um, they're 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 really trying to improve themselves as as uh, performers. Um, and of course they've got health and health and uh, well being as a goal as well. But the majority of people we, we're uh, uh, talking to in the community is the people who are actually race orientated. So so. From what you've just given us a, a really a good uh, briefing of what's happened in, in to you just in the last year um, with with balancing everything that's going on in your world um, with with some sickness with uh, some distraction from uh, having some fun traveling um, and so that that makes the consistency goal really difficult doesn't it and and so the balanced athlete is kind of what we preach a lot in our in our coaching is that you're going to have days where and weeks and months probably where things don't go your way um and it's it's those times where you're planning and and you know management of your of your daily uh life your weekly life and what's going ahead in in months to come is is really important so so you know things like you know your family your work and then the passion which you're doing whatever sport you, you've chosen to do what are your key things that you, what are the tips that you would give um, to the listeners out there about trying to get that all important consistency thing um, into your, into your program of everyday living? Yeah, that is the, the key issue. You're right that uh, most people fall down on the consistency side. Consistency doesn't mean just do 10 or 12 months in a row and call it good. It means doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workouts consistently. That's what it's all about. Um, I kind of think of this from a different perspective. I, I think of myself when it comes to this as being a role model for somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm a role model for, number one, my son. He's now 52 years old, by the way. And I was a role model for him growing up, and I wanted him to understand how important it was to be to exercise and to be fit. And so I saw my my workouts. If I ever had any doubt whether or not I wanted to do the workout today, mind and myself, I am a role model for my son. Well, that worked because my son went on to race as a, a pro cyclist in Europe back in the 19, uh, 1990s. Um, race continued to race pro in the U.S. Now he's 52 years old. He just won uh, the Masters division in a four-day stage race in uh, Colorado, which is pretty tough competition here last week. Um, and he's still you know, very consistent in his training. And I think he's doing the same thing I'm doing. He sees himself as a role model for his daughter, who is now 19 years old. And, um, you know, that that sort of way of seeing the world, I, I'm here to help somebody else. 
that somebody else for me was always my son. And that's what kept me going. Sure, there are plenty of days when I got up and I say, you know, I'd, I'd really rather not work out today. It'd be nice just to just to take Sunday off and just kind of like read the paper and watch television and all that kind of stuff. But the next thing I know, the Monday would be the same thing. I'd get up Monday and say, oh, you know, it felt so good yesterday. I think I'll do it again today. Do nothing. And, you know, that was the sort of thing I always told myself. I'm, well, you're, the reason you're doing this is because of your son. That's why you do this is for him. When he was a kid, I wanted him to be very aware of exercise and, um, uh, and and what it means to your health and your the sort of thing that uh, drives me to stay consistent. I try not to miss workouts at all, although I'll, I'll admit today I missed one workout because I was uh, I didn't sleep very well last night. I woke up, I was tired, I had to go out and ride. So that day I've taken from the hospital a few weeks ago. And I'll be back in the saddle again tomorrow morning. Can't wait, in fact. Um, but that's the sort of thing I think most of us can just to do is to think about this as not doing it for yourself, but doing it for other people. In my case, it was always I was always doing it for my son. I want to grow up with the right attitude about healthness. And he does it for his daughter. And so, I, and hopefully she will pass it on when she has a child and she does the same sort of thing. She becomes a role model for her child. Uh, that that's, that's how I saw this dilemma. Everybody's probably got their own way of solving this idea of consistency, but that's, that's what, how I do it. Just by seeing myself as I'm doing this for somebody else. It's not just me. And where do you get that, uh, that mentality right where you have to make a decision between the example you just gave of choosing consistency, but then also knowing when to not train because we can try and drum this message into ourselves that consistency is the most important thing, but there are some days when you need to rest. Like you said, you had a really poor sleep. You're still coming back um, from those those problems you spoke about. And uh, in your case, not training was the right decision, but then that feels a little, a little bit conflicting because you want to aim for consistency. So how do you get that mentality right in, in finding that balance? You're exactly right, um, Jordan. That That's... That's the big challenge athletes, highly motivated athletes run into is they cannot say no. Um, they, they drive themselves beyond um, what is health. And um, because of that, they get themselves into all kinds of problems, not only physiologically, but also psychologically, I found, is because they just drive themselves so hard that um, they eventually break down. You, nobody can drive themselves to the point of exhaustion day after day after day for the rest of their lives without breaking down somehow. So it's it's actually very important and, and it's a great skill for an athlete to know when it's time to take a break. Even though this break is not scheduled, even though you'd like to go out and work out, you know, psychologically you feel like you ought to go out there and do it. You know physiologically you shouldn't because like in my case today, I'm just, I was just very tired. I was fatigued. I just came off my biggest training week uh, last week from, the, from all this travel stuff and everything else that was going on in my life. And that had made me tired. And then I had four nights of sleep besides that. So I said, drinking my cup of coffee, thinking about what I'm going to do today. And, you know, it, it dawned on me, you really shouldn't do anything today. You should take it easy. And so I did. And uh, that's just part of being an athlete is knowing when to take the day off and when to, when not to. When we talk about um, getting our balance right, and you've given so many good examples, Take us through some of the key things that that you think will contribute uh, to improving your performance, but still maintaining the balance. For example, I can think off the top of my head, um, we on this program have lots of advice from nutrition, and some of yeah. it's extremely extremely um, specific, and some of it's very general. Um, you know, nutrition, sleep, um, learning from your mistakes. Um, uh, reviewing your performances, give us some give us some key things that you think contribute to enabling you to get that balance right and still improve your performance. Yeah, the two big things really are number one, sleep. Um, athletes, for the most part, especially um, especially older athletes. I, I don't mean professional athletes or elite athletes. No, I mean age groupers. We tend not to get enough sleep because we try to wedge too much into our into our day. Um, we, you know, the, the typical age group athlete has got a day job, has a family, um, 
probably doing something else in their life, like volunteering for an organization someplace or doing things at work that's took them into the evening very late. And uh, the thing that always they, they give up, these athletes, the thing they always in their time, in their day, they, they give up to fit more things in is sleep. They just do not, people don't, do not get enough sleep. If you're not getting at least seven hours of sleep per night, at least seven hours of sleep per night, and you're an aging athlete, if you're, you know, if you're in your 50s, 60s especially, you've got to be getting more sleep. Uh, even and, and younger athletes the same way. In fact, the younger you get, the more you need. Uh, a teenager probably ought to be sleeping nine hours per night, and they they try to. I know my my granddaughter who's now nineteen, and when we took her on vacation with us, she can sleep like the devil. Man, she can really put away those hours in bed, uh, and that's good. I mean, that's that's the sort of thing you got to be able to do when you're that age is get enough sleep. That's when everything happens that's good for your fitness. That's when all the the hormones are released into your bloodstream that that build uh, that build your body, rebuild you uh, every night if you get enough sleep. If you don't get enough sleep, you lose out on some of the stuff you tried to accomplish in your workout that day. Uh, your workout had a lot of losses in it because you just didn't take advantage of that and the things you could have gained had you gotten enough sleep that night. You know, you, a hard workout. You're not you're not more fit right after a hard workout. You're at it right after a hard workout. It's not until you sleep that you begin to realize the benefits that the hard workout gave you. So that's the starting place. <clears throat> you got to get more sleep. One of the things I, when I'm coaching anymore, but when I was coaching, one of the things that I always do is ask athletes how much sleep they were getting per night. And if they weren't getting seven hours, then we had to have a conversation about something had to go in their lives. Um, <clears throat> if they had a very high goal, it mean, meant we had to get and only three things left in life. If they wanted to qualify for Ironman Hawaii, if they wanted to be on the podium at some big race, or if they wanted to just do something which they've never done before, which is a, would be a gigantic uh, achievement for them, they had to get down to three things in their life. Number one would be their family. Um, you're not going to quit your family just so you can get in an Ironman race. You're going to quit your jobs. So that's number two. You're going to have a job in your life, your career. And number three, you're going to have training. That's it. If you have a high goal, those are really the only three things you can fit into your life and make it work as far as being able to accomplish your goal. If you start try to stick in fourth thing, let's say the person says, you know, I think what I'd like to do is take up tennis also. There's take up tennis and be able to qualify for Ironman Hawaii. Now, that's not going to work. Um, so we can't do that. You can do that after you've qualified, after the race is over. Now you can take up tennis, play all you want. Or they want to volunteer to be on uh, a, a, the board of directors for a nonprofit organization. That's great. Let's wait until after you've you've qualified and actually done your Ironman. Then you can do that. So sleep is critical, and that was always a key thing. The first thing I would look for in athletes is, is are they getting enough sleep? And if they aren't, we had to figure out a way to – to change that so they could. And quite honestly, that's the most important thing I probably ever did for any of my athletes is just make sure they got enough sleep. Uh, the workouts are not that difficult to come up with at all or the, or the training plan. That, those things are, are actually pretty easy to do. It's trying to make it take advantage of your training so you, you, you grow as an athlete. That's the hard part. So the first thing you got to do is you got to get enough sleep. Second thing you got to do is you got to get your diet right. Um, so many people in our society, eat junk food all day long. I'm, I'm amazed when I go some places sometimes and I see people eating. Uh, the stuff they're eating is just amazing. It's just big packages of things like potato chips and candy bars and uh, just all this junk food. And they eat it as, as if it somehow is going to be beneficial for them. I'm not sure how they see that, but somehow they like maybe if nothing else, they like they get a sugar high off of it. But that's they. We just eat far too much stuff like that in our diets. You know what my wife always talks about is when she goes to the grocery store, she typically buys food from the perimeter of the grocery store. That's where all the the healthy stuff is. Go down the aisles in the middle of the grocery store. That's where you find most all the, the packaged, you know, high uh, uh, high sugar, high starch, uh, highly processed foods is in the middle aisles. And so she typically doesn't go down there very much. She's always looking for things on the perimeter of the, of the 
of the grocery store. So diet is very important, but and, and people can improve that. You know, if you don't keep junk food around the house, you're not going to eat it. That's that's the key. Just don't keep it in your house. If, if you've got it in your house, you're going to wind up eating it. So, you know, just if you don't buy it, you're going to be much healthier in the long term. You can keep your, your body fat down. You'll train better. You'll get better results. Uh, everything starts coming together. But you need those two things. Um, and then the third thing I tell people is, is kind of along the lines of what we already talked about is, you know, uh, if you're going to train, you need to know when to train hard and when to train easy. And uh, the easy part, you got to make sure it's really easy. That's, that's where people fall down. They do easy workouts, easy enough. They make the hard hard, but the easy workouts are typically not easy enough. They don't really get much benefit from those. They think that they go hard, they'll become more fit, but it, actually it's just the opposite. If you go easy, if you go slow on those five easy days a week, you'll wind up with, uh, with much, much better aerobic fitness down the road than if you did you know, five moderately hard workouts per week, which is what most people do. I want to ask about that specifically because it's something we always like to ask coaches their theories on, um, you know, zone one, pure recovery sessions versus zone two, aiming for a little bit of aerobic benefit. What are your thoughts on those easy sessions and where do you sit in that range of zone one to zone two? Because um, technically, you know, you can if you are used to the frequency of training and used to the volume of training, you can push to the upper end of that zone two without crossing that lactate threshold, get the training effect without, you know, exhausting the body. What's your theory on, uh, is that too risky still for you in your mind? Are you saying no, go easier, sit at the bottom of zone two, even do some more sessions in, in zone one, that pure recovery kind of style. What's, what's your theory around that? I tell athletes that the easier, the better. If they can keep it easy, they're going to get a lot more aerobic benefit out of it. Um, they, when athletes ask me, how do I know if it's easy? You know, you, know you, you should know from being in the sport a long time what is really easy or not. But, however, if you have to have something that helps you as a tool, what I tell them to do is to yourself saying happy birthday to you. And if you, if you can't get through happy birthday to you without taking a breath, it was, it's too hard. So sing happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Take a breath. Happy birthday to you. Take a breath. Happy birthday, dear uh, Jared. Happy birthday to you. If you can do that, then then you're you're. It's easy. If you can't do that, it's not easy. That, that's just one. It's the same idea as going for a run with somebody and carrying on a conversation. If you can't carry on a conversation without taking a breath every four or five words. It's too hard. I just tell you right there, it's just too hard. Uh, I prefer not to tell people about zones one and two and so forth. Uh, probably because I find so many people have their zones wrong to begin with. It, it's really kind of becomes useless information for them. They may think they're doing things right, but or, or I, the other side, what I usually get is the other side. I can't get my heart rate low enough. I can't get it to zone one. Well, that tells me they got a problem with their zones if they can't get to zone one. So, you know, so they're, so I prefer not to talk about zones too much with them unless I was involved in helping to set their zones up. Then it's different. But if they're, if I've had some athlete who I don't know says they can't get into zone one, I realize the problem here is probably not the fact that they're low enough or, or bike slowly enough. The problem is they've got their zones set up incorrectly. That's, that's, yeah, that's a really great point. I, um, I want to take, this uh, topic to training specificity. So you've given us unbelievable uh, insight into how to approach aging, how to approach balance um, from, you know, it's, it's a lot about your perspective on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and you quote unquote said that the actual training itself is probably the easy part in comparison to all this, but we want to dive into the training specifically. And we're interested in your thoughts in relation to training for endurance events. And um, we, we coach athletes from in a range of events from marathon running to 70.39 men into endurance swimming and uh, ultra running gravel riding, which is really taking off now, which are really long events of nine to 14 hours. Um, and all these events are three hours up to 15 hours. So uh, yeah. we want you to focus a training answer uh, in relation to looking at uh, firstly, uh, how to train to endure the requirements of the event. Uh, what's most important in your eyes? Yeah, the most important thing is is the duration when you talk about being able to endure the, the event. 
it's not how long the event was in terms of kilometers or miles. It's how many hours or minutes, whichever it is we're talking about here, is it going to take you? And then getting to the point that you can maintain your uh, maintain a level of of uh, low a low level of uh, effort intensity uh, for that period of time. That's that's the starting place. Now there are some some ob- obviously some uh, exceptions to this. In the U.S., we have a, a race called Race Across America on a bicycle, which takes days and days and days, some people weeks. To, certainly, we're not going to try to go out and do that to get ready for it. So we're going to break it down into some pieces and find out which is the piece that we're, we need to work on. But if you're doing something which is more reasonable, like you're doing, a, for example, and you want to be able to do a, a, a three-hour marathon, well, the first thing you got to be able to do is run for three hours, not at marathon pace, but just for easy, nice and slow and easy. You got to build up to doing that. That builds that aerobic fitness. That's basically the five days a week of, of my five two plan I mentioned a while ago. So you're you're working on building um, that that general aerobic fitness by, by getting to the point that you can maintain the the duration, but not necessarily the intensity. That's the first thing you do, and that's and along the lines of doing this, you're doing lots of other things also. I won't get into all the details, but they're like uh, your skills, running skills, pedaling skills, swimming skills, all these skills. This is a time to be working on those things. At the same time, you're working on building this this aerobic base by working on going the the, the duration of of the race you're aiming at. Once we get through that, then we start moving toward a, a more specific period of training. Uh, where the athlete's going to be doing things that are much more like the race. So now instead of going out and doing a, a three-and-a-half-hour run, what the athlete is going to do is maybe um, uh, do some intervals that are done long intervals, perhaps something like 880-meter 800, 800 inter- intervals at um, marathon intensity, marathon pace, and uh, building up the number of those you can do in a, in a single session. That would be an example for a runner running a marathon to start focusing on the intensity side of training. They've already got the aerobic fitness built. Now they start working on the intensity side, the, uh, the specificity. But um, along the line of doing that, they've got to maintain the base fitness they built, the, the general fitness they built up earlier. And so we still blend in those longer runs that are done at an easy intensity. So the idea is that we, we start bringing together, we start off by working on the, the general side of fitness, which is primarily just the endurance side, just being able to do things for a fairly long period of time, depending on what you're training for. And then that gradually becomes more and more like the event you're training for because more specific to the event you're training for. In other words, the intensity of the, of the event becomes uh, the focus of your training. Once you've got the, the more general side, the, the aerobic side built, and we can bring all both of those things together by maintaining the general side as the specific side is being uh, brought together. Uh, and we come to race day with both of these things if we've done everything correctly. And there's lots more details so we're not going into, obviously. If you've done that, you come to race day being able to run your marathon in three hours and 30 minutes. So that's the sort of thing you would do. It, it, the same idea, no matter what your sport is, you the same concept and apply it to your sport and you should do quite well in your event on race day. That's a great answer. And um, I want to just go a little bit further and and just ask your opinion on, so you've done your, your first marathon that you've been training for and you've done it in three hours 30. You've reached your, your, your goal target. And then, you know, the next two years, you want to see if you can do 3.15 and get down to th- three hours. You would, in my imagination try to repeat a similar program what things would you try and implement into your program joe if you wanted to you know improve your intensity in the race what are the what are the sessions for an endurance athlete yeah. we're talking about here that that you feel are the best bang for your buck to to get that person because you've set up the standard they've got the the you know the time in their feet what what sessions do you think are going to be key to letting them enabling them to 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 be a better version that they were a year ago or two years ago? Yeah, this is this is a difficult question to ask, answer because it depends on who we're talking about. Uh, if if the athlete is brand new to the sport and they've just been able 
you know, they, they've been at running for a year and they've just been able to finish off a 330 marathon, which is the goal. Um, then I would say if this is a new athlete, they've got a lot of room for improvement yet. We could, I'm not sure where we can go. It depends on a lot, lot more variables like how old are you and uh, how's your, how's your general health? Do you have injury problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have the time to go? But I'm sure if this is a relatively new athlete and things are, are good in their life, we could have them down to three hours within two years. Uh, that should be easily attainable for that type of athlete who's new to the sport. If the athlete's been around the sport for a long time, let's say eight, 10, 12 years, uh, not so much. You know, the chances of going from 30 to a three hour in, in two years, really, re really very, very distant possibility, unless the student, the, the athlete has just not been training well. If their at training has been very inconsistent, doing all the wrong things, then possibly yes. So, so it kind of depends on who we're talking about. And it's always difficult to answer those questions without knowing the person because it really comes down, excuse me, down to who they are and um, what they can do with their, with their physiology and, and psychology uh, to produce the result they're wanting. So in that sense, what, what uh, you say that, you know, um, it is a relatively simple process. That doesn't mean it's easy, but relatively simple uh, to improve. Yeah, what kind of what kind of sessions specifically are you thinking that people need to incorporate more of once they've got that frequency of training and that volume of training down pat? What what kind of high intensity sessions do you like prescribing to people? Um, this is this is the the, the um, specificity part of the season, like the last let's say twelve weeks before the event. In that case, we need to start doing things which become increasingly like the event. Um, so let's use the marathon thing again. Uh, if an athlete is training for a marathon, avoid mm -hmm. the base up in the general training period is 12 weeks. Now we're 12 weeks out from the race. I would start having that are uh, that that include more uh, race intensity. Not very long at first. It may only be three to five minute intervals um, done at, a, at at race intensity or slightly faster. And but over the course of several the next several weeks, what that will become is it will become something which brings them to the point that they can run um, any number of, of long distance repeats, you know, kilometer repeats or two kilometer repeats even at race pace with relatively short recoveries between them. When they can get to the point, they can they can do a workout like that that simulates a piece of the race. Um, and they can do it at race pace, and though they've got something left in the tank once they've got the work done, then I know we're in a really good place for the athlete being able to achieve their goal, which may be whatever, a 315 marathon of the next year. So I, so it comes down to really just kind of nurturing that, that intensity and bringing it along uh, gradually up on them all of a sudden with doing, doing things that are extremely intense or extremely long durations for uh, an intensity like a marathon intensity, but things that allow them to adapt over time. And that, that's one of the places where self-coached athletes fall down is they just don't allow for um, these changes to take place in their body. They become impatient, and they think that somehow they can force their body to become fit by, by doing workouts which are extremely hard in which they discover they really can't. If they do, they push themselves too hard, and they're, they're so tired the next day they can hardly get out of bed. If that's the case, then they're really ruining, ruining their, their chances of having a good, a good race. The issue now becomes how can we hold the athlete back so that we do this very gradually? You know, we have to be very, um, very gentle with the body. We can't, we can't hammer the body into fitness. It becomes fit by doing things very gradually over a long period of time. And if we do that, then We'll see the benefit. Um, it only comes to how much time have we got. Um, the more, the farther the, the athlete is from having being being able to achieve their goal, the more time they need to get ready for it. So, for a 315 marathon, and you only have six weeks to go until the race. If you if the best you've run up until then is 330, you know we're probably going to need another year to get to that point again because that, that's a 15 minute jump is gigantic, even somebody who is new to the sport. So we got to make sure we get enough time to, to do what's required because we cannot hurry the body into becoming fit. 
that's a brilliant answer and uh, really helps um, people understand that uh, time is is really one of the key considerations. You, you can't just fast track things uh, because you're motivated and you want to train hard. It in, invariably causes the opposite to happen. Um, one of the things I wanted to get your opinion on is um, for endurance athletes, and we've talked a lot about um, the aging athlete and and the need for high intensity training. Um, regardless, we were talking about didn't really matter about the the event they were they were uh, aiming to do. It was just in general the aging athlete will keep a good level of fitness by doing some intensity. What's your what's your opinion as a as a an endurance coach and endurance athlete? Sh- should there be you know two high intensity training sessions in an, an endurance program that are well above uh, the race intensity? Um, probably yes. Um, we start getting into a lot of who are we talking about again here sort of things, but probably the answer is yes. I would say most of the time it's yes. Um, these would be things like VO2 intervals for athletes. An athlete for a marathon um, would benefit from having a high VO2 max but that's not specific to the event. You know, high VO2 max means doing things that's quite fast. I mean, that means running faster than than uh, than mile pace or, you know, two-kilometer pace. Running faster than two-kilometer pace is moving, is, is something like a VO2 max pace. But you're not going to do that any place at all during a, during a marathon if your goal is a 3.30 marathon. So the time to do that is in that general period of training, which is starts somewhere around, let's say, 24 weeks before the race. You start throwing in some some workouts along that line once you've got some general uh, fitness built, especially base aerobic fitness. Then you can start sneaking in a few of these workouts that, that kind of get you going with the, the higher intensity stuff because that will boost your VO2 max. And then as we move into the more specific of training the last 12 weeks before the marathon in this case, we would cut those out and start doing things which are more like the race itself as far as the intensity. So I think it just depends on what we're training for and, and who the athlete is to some extent also. One message you've really hammered this entire episode, and it's just something I always love hearing from you, is the message of uh, almost simplicity. It's uh, it's consistency. It's not overcomplicating things, and uh, there's no magical answer. It's all these things combined, and uh, whether we're talking about um, how to uh, uh, prevent that loss of performance with age, whether we're talking about balance, but whether we're talking about specific training sessions, uh, you're always coming back to not overcomplicating it and simplifying it. And I think that's a really good take-home message that there's there's no more magical answers out there that we need to try and find. It's all there. It's just about doing them consistently. I'd like to finish by asking, is there any kind of message um, that you think the triathlon or cycling community are still not getting that you're trying to push? Is there anything that you really want um, coaches and athletes alike out there to understand? I think we've touched on all those points, but let me just emphasize that last point that you brought up there because I think this is really the key. This The, the key to, cons- to training is consistency. The key to performance is consistency. Um, I sometimes tell athletes, I would rather you did the wrong workouts consistently than the right workouts inconsistently. You get a lot more out of it uh, because consistency is the key piece here. It's really not so much the workouts. It's just doing it consistently. Whatever it may be you're doing, do it on a regular basis. Don't, you know, try to avoid missed workouts that are only because you don't feel like doing it. Uh, if there's a good reason for it, yeah, you shouldn't do it. Otherwise, you know, let's get out there and do the workout. Um, I used to tell clients when I first started coaching, I coached people who were novices, brand new to exercise. I gave them this long list of things they wanted to do to kind of make sure they were consistent. And for example, one of the things was for the, one, of the, one of the best things you can do if you want to be consistent is get a training partner. If you know you're supposed to go for a run that morning and uh, you don't really feel like it, but you know your training partner is waiting down at the corner for you to show up, you'll get out there and you'll meet him and you'll do your workout. Uh, you know, having little things in your life like that that kind of get you going are sometimes really helpful in helping you become consistent. And that that's number one, is always having a, a training partner. Then there's all these other little things I used to tell my clients all the time, you know, little things like lay out your clothes the night before you're going to wear for the workout because you don't have to think about which shorts am I going to wear today. 
in my workout that's already done. All you got to do is get out of bed, you know, whatever you do, you know, get a cup of coffee, whatever it is, put your clothes on and go out the door and do your workout. Um, so you have to think about what you're going to wear. You review the workout the night before for your training plan. If you have a question, you call me, your coach. I'll answer the night before so you're ready to go the first first thing in the morning. So I gave them all these things they could do that would help them become consistent. If they just did all these things, and one of the things was if you start the workout and you get in, in, in your – let me back up. Let's say you're not really sure you want to do the workout. You don't really feel like doing it today. There's no real great reason for this. You're not tired. Nothing's wrong. You just feel like staying home and being lazy today. Well, here's something to, to do. What I would tell my athletes in that case is go out for five minutes. Just go out the door and start it for five minutes. If at the end of five minutes you don't, you still don't want to do it, come on back home and call it quits. But if the end is fine, five minutes into it, it's okay now. They're they're going to be able to do the rest of the workout. So I, I used to give them all these this list of all these things, and I talk about these things with them so they understood how to take advantage of them. But the idea was. Be consistent. That's the whole bottom line for training, for exercise, for, for sport, especially endurance sport, is consistency. You've got to do it day after day after day after day with, with very few breaks, and those breaks should only be because you have extremely good reasons for, for missing a workout. Well, I don't think we could get a, a clearer message to everybody listening, and it's just gold because that is exactly what we – Profess in our coaching is you've just got to turn up um, and unless you've got a really you've got a really good reason and and it's not an excuse it's a reason um, then then you should be just aiming to to as we say put your shoes and socks on and then you're on your way but to to, to actually say go out for five minutes and see how you go I think that's a, a better analogy than I'm always saying put your shoes and socks on and see you know see if you want to continue to to, to proceed to your training session, but uh, actually getting out there for five minutes is a better way, I think. Uh, that's, that's a gold little tip. Um, so, uh, yeah, just really pleased and thankful, Joe, that, you know, we can still get your wisdom and uh, the things that you've you've learned over so many years as, a, as one of the leading uh, coaches uh, in the world and and some of the, the stuff that you've um, put out there is uh, – is just gold and, and it would help so many people get to their de journey and destination um, in the right shape. And uh, yeah, we want to thank you again for giving us the time and we really do appreciate your expertise and uh, your knowledge and, and I'm hopefully uh, the people listening are, are as equally as uh, um, grateful to, to the time you give to us. So thank you very much. Jared and Jordy, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with both of you. It's always, it's always enjoyable to talk with athletes and coaches and, and, uh, uh, see what else we can talk about that that uh, we can share with other people. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah, just to finish off and reiterate Dad's point, it's an absolute privilege to be able to talk to you. you you've just been such a, uh, a golden voice in the industry for so long and so many coaches out there are coaching based on, on your knowledge and, and your teachings. So um, yeah, just want to reiterate, reiterate that and thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, we hope we can speak to you in the future um, and we really enjoyed this episode. So to all the listeners out there, we hope you got a lot out of it. Please take these words of wisdom seriously. Uh, it's all in the simplicity. It's all in everything that Joe's spoken about. And uh, if you apply these things uh, consistently over time, you will become a better athlete. So thanks again, Joe. And that's it for this episode. To everyone listening, we'll see you next one.